The first talk will be given by William Bakke. The new title is, A New NEO Model Shows the Disruption of Asteroids Near the Sun. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I have to stick to time because she's my boss, right, so. Okay. Okay, so this is sort of a mixed audience, so I thought I'd start a little bit talking a little bit about where the near-Earth objects come from in the first place. Then we'll build into the model and go from there. So, so this, is a pot, this is a plot showing the near-Earth object, or many of the near-Earth objects and many of the small bodies we have in the inner solar system. So what you're looking at here is a plot of semi-major axis and eccentricity. And the blue and yellow guys here, these are called the Atens and Apollos. These are bodies that can cross the orbit of the Earth, and so they have a chance to hit the Earth. The red guys over here are called the Amors. These are objects that are nearly Earth-crossing, but not quite. So they can't hit, but they might in the near future. So traditionally, this is all called the near-Earth object population. All right, so now what's interesting about this is that these objects are unstable over fairly short time scales. So uh, objects over here tend to go away in a few million years or so. If you're on an orbit where you cross the orbit of Jupiter, like the Jupiter family comets, you, go away, you can go away in 100,000 years. So it's very fast. So this cannot be a primordial population. It has to be replenished over time. And so over... I guess de years, decades of work, lots of people have worked on trying to come up with a scenario on how to replenish them. Okay, so, and we think the story in brief, in about 30 seconds, is, this is how it goes, right? So this is sort of a top view of the solar system. We're trying to make these red guys. And the reservoir for that provides most near-Earth objects is the main asteroid belt. So we think the story on how we get near-Earth objects is something like this. You have a collision in the main belt that produces fragments. Okay, so here's some fun little animations of what you might get out of a hydrocode simulation with the fragments. And this all looks very impressive, but most of these fragments don't go very far away from the impact site. A typical ejection velocity is on the order of the escape velocity of your target body. So these things are make a lot of fragments, but they don't go anywhere. And so that's, not, that's no good for making near-Earth objects. So we need something else. Okay? So from there, we need to invoke dynamical processes. And so there's a couple of things to say here. Um, one dynamical process, which uh, we've done a lot of work on over the last few years, and it's turning out to be really important for things, is this thing called the Yurkowski effect. So what that is, is you have an asteroid spinning in space, it heats up from sunlight, and then it re-radiates the energy in the infrared. But it does this in an anisotropic manner. So it actually, you know, it causes a small little thrust, because it's hotter on the afternoon side than it is at noontime. And so what happens is objects can spiral inward towards the sun, or spiral outward towards the sun, depending on what their spin axis is. Just to give you a feeling for this, so this is semi major axis, this is eccentricity. These red guys, this is the observed Coronas asteroid family. So this is what we see from one of these breakup events. This is what the hydrocodes would predict for that Coronas family. And so let's see if I can play the little games they have here. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start this, and you'll see how things evolve. So th some things go in, some things go out. And when you see them making these jumps, they're hitting special zones where the gravitational kicks of the giant planets become very important. These are called resonances, and they can actually change their eccentricities, or in some cases, they can be pushed all the way out of the asteroid belt. Okay. So here's, if you want to see what happens in the powerful resonance, I have a couple animations here. So this is where I've started a whole bunch of objects in a very powerful and useful resonance for near-Earth objects. This is called the New Six Secular Resonance. So you see all these red dots flying around. Every time they go anywhere, they leave behind a green circle, so you can sort of see things. Here's what happens if you see things wandering in by the Yarkovsky effect and they hit the resonance. So these animations are sort of two flavors of the same thing here. Now, there's a bunch of interesting things you could say here, and I'm going to talk a little bit more of this in a bit. But this is to some degree how we characterize where we get near-Earth objects from. Okay. So what you can do with, an with animations like that, other than that they're fun, is that you can sort of keep track of where they spend time in different regions of some major axis space, eccentricity space, or inclination space. So you can keep track of these little bins. And if you keep track of all the time that they spend there, you get a probability distribution. So that's all this is. And this actually tells us statistically where these objects are most likely to be located. This actually tells us if you run these models all the way until, they, until the, all the particles die, this gives you the steady state of what that population be coming from that source. So we've used uh, tricks like this to our advantage in coming up with models of the near-Earth object population. Okay? So back in 2002, we did some neat things, uh, but we only had a limited number of uh, well, computers were slower, we were dumber, that sort of thing. But now we're much smarter. <laughs> You know, so, so now, we're, now we're doing things in 2015. Mikhail Gronvik is leading this project. We put most of the people, you know, most of the band is back together now to help them on this. And we're come up with a new model for the near-Earth object population. So I'm going to tell you some of the new things that are in this. Okay. So first of all, we've, through years and years of study and lots and lots of dynamical uh, integrations and the rest, we've been able to sort of break the asteroid down into some major supply routes for near-Earth objects. I've tried, I've just put some names on here. I'm not going to go through them because I don't have time. 
Um, you can break this down into a few sites or 30 sites or 100 sites, but really if we're just trying to get a dynamically distinct region that produces near-Earth objects. Okay? And so what we do is we integrate objects out of those, um, out of those uh, regions, and then every one of them gives us a very separate probability distribution. Okay? So ideally, if we add all these up and we've done it absolutely correctly, you have the near-Earth object population. It's really that simple. Okay. But the problem we have is that we don't know, is this, is this source 10 times more important than this source? Is this source five times more important than this source? You know, we don't know. So somehow we have to figure out a way to put this together correctly. And that means we have to compare our results to constraints. So back in 2002, uh, the best we had available was, were asteroids that were discovered by Spacewatch. And we had to think about in the order of about 170, 200 detections or so. And, you know, that was pretty good for the time. But, you know, we can do much better now. So we got together with Ed Bayshore and the Catalina Sky Survey folks, and they gave us several thousands of, detection, thousands of detections from two different sites that the Catalina Sky Survey does. So this is a different plots of semi dirac access centricity inclination of all their detections, and we're going to use this to try to fit our results. Okay? So ideally, if we do this correctly, all these near-Earth objects should be on the peaks of all our probability distributions, and you have the right answer. But there's an issue. That has to do with observational selection effects. Okay, so there's a movie over here I'm going to show again. Uh, I don't, I'll explain why. So just focus on here for a second. So what are observational selection effects? So think of a survey that's looking into space. So you have like Catalina that's looking into the sky. And think of sort of a cone that goes out from the Earth that gets bigger as you go further away. So if you have an asteroid that's bright enough, that's above the detection thresholds, and it's actually moving in your detection uh, cone, you can see it, right? So it turns out really bright things are actually really easy to see far away. And they're actually harder to see close up, but that's because the cone is really big out here and it's kind of small here. Okay? If you go to smaller sizes, then all of a sudden you get objects that are dim enough that they actually fall below your detection threshold. And so then you can only see them in certain places, but then your cone is smaller. Okay? So then what happens is you can only see them a little bit, see them at a closer distance. And if you get down to really small guys, about the only place you can see them is if they're almost right on top of the Earth. And this is why it's relatively easy to find big near-Earth objects, but getting these small ones is going to take a long time because our, our telescopes have, lit, have limitations. So we have to account for all this for this Catalina Sky Survey. So I'm going to show a movie over here again, and that just shows how, as a function of size, uh, the, the observational selection effects change. Right? So you can see how it's easy to see things far away, and then as you go to smaller and smaller objects, then it gets to be, you know, you only can see them when they're pretty close to the Earth. Okay? So we put all this into our model. So what we did is we took the observational selection effects, we multiplied them by every possible combination of our sources, and then we compared it to the data. And so here's a representation of our best fit. Okay, so the, blue, the purple here is where we have a good match in semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, and absolute magnitude, which is sort of a proxy for diameter. Okay, so big objects are over here and small objects are there. Uh, where you see a red is where we have too many model objects, and where you see this kind of light blue is where we have too many observed objects. And you can see, for the most part, we do a pretty good job. The match is very satisfying. And this is, you know, we were, we were pretty, pretty gratified by all this. Okay. So this is what we had back in 2002. Okay. This is what we're getting from 2015. And what's nice about this is that, for the most part, you see the models look pretty similar, which is nice. It means we weren't crazy back in 2002. But the, now we can actually do some things we simply couldn't do in the past. So I'm going to actually see if I can start this movie. There we go. Okay. So this shows now how the, orb how the orbital distribution changes at a function of absolute magnitude. So it, it, the, as the numbers get bigger, you're getting the smaller diameters. And you can see that the orbits of near-Earth objects change as a function of size. And that's because different sources, essentially, you have a family that may have more small bodies, and it becomes more important for certain sources and you get the smaller and smaller objects. This is something we simply couldn't do back in 2002. So there's some really neat things we have here, so we're, we're happy with this. Okay, just for reference, this is, again, absolute magnitude. Our model predicts there's about a thousand kilometer size near Earth objects, and that's pretty close to what other people have gotten as well. We also predict the near Earth object population has a wavy shape, and this is something that Al Harris and some others have done for a while. So we're all pretty consistent. So you know that's that's a great story so far, but it's you know not it's, it's not as interesting as one would like. Okay, so now here's the fun, interesting part, and that of course it always involves problems. Okay, so this is a plot showing the perihelion distance of the near Earth objects. Here's what Catalina Sky Survey is finding in gray. And here's what our model is predicting in this sort of dash line. And you can see our model is predicting many, many ob more objects closer to the sun than Catalina C. And when we saw this, we were stumped. And there's a big group of us, and we spent you know, days, years arguing about this, trying to figure out what was going on. One possibility is our dynamics were just wrong. So we tried every possible permutation of this. But dynamically, 
this, this region gets filled. There's things that go there. So we don't think that's the answer. We thought of it was an observational bias, but we looked at everything. It doesn't seem obvious. That's it. So ultimately, we had to resort to other mechanisms. Okay. So what? So what we thought about and thinking or considering all this is we went to some work that was recently done by the Wise, the Neo Wise Group. So you heard Joe Massiero talking yesterday in a paper by uh, by Amy Meitzer, who runs the team. They looked at the albedos of lots of near Earth objects, and what they found is you know, lots of interesting albedos, the albedos are over here, but they found something of a deficit of low albedo asteroids that are on Aten orbit. So these are guys that are pretty close to the sun, and yet they're seeing a deficit, and they read, mentioned a paper, we don't understand this. And when we thought about it, we thought, well, maybe that's a, that's a clue that something interesting is going on. Okay, so, so there's this. There's also the fact that when you look at this model, you're going to see these guys come up, and many of these objects get very close to the sun. Some actually hit the sun. But other objects actually go very close to the sun, and then they go away, and they kind of wander down and do all these interesting things. Okay? And we wondered, well, what happens if these objects get really close to the sun? Something bad happens, so they physically disrupt. This is something we can actually check. So we tried different games saying, let's have the objects come out and break up and see what happens. And it turned out this started to look like it could solve our problems in a really interesting way. Okay? So to check this, what we did is we took the information we have from wise albedos. We also have slow digital sky survey colors. We sort of propagate them through our model, and ultimately we're using these, excuse me, these data to predict what the albedo distribution is for our near-Earth objects or so. So this is all very quick. I'm just going to show you the, the, a, a reasonable plot on all this. So these are our NEOs that have albedos less than about 30%. And you can see the, the difference between model and data is pretty good. Okay? But you go down to NEOs that have an albedo less than 10%, the model's really good until this last bin. And all of a sudden we're predicting a bunch of objects, but yet observed it crashes through the floor. So we are missing low albedo asteroids close to the sun. Okay? And so the question is, what's going on? So we actually did some modeling of this. And we actually allowed objects at certain sizes to get close to the sun and break up. And we fit for the best results. So what we find here is if you're up around one kilometer or so, we find that asteroids, if, they, if asteroids break up at about 0.06 AU, 0 0.06 AU from the sun, our model works really well. But as you go to smaller sizes, let's say down to 50 meters or so, we find here that you could actually, if you break up at about 0.2 AU away from the sun, then we need that to get our model to work. So there's actually a size dependence here. Okay? So smaller things break up further from the sun than big objects. That kind of intuitively makes sense. And this is what we need to make everything work. So there's a suggestion we're missing low albedo asteroids because something is physically happening to them. Okay? So I'm just going to end on this. We today, I'll say this today, we do not understand what is causing these asteroids to break up. We have lots of guesses. There's lots of mechanisms in the literature. I'm going to suggest one today that's kind of fun that maybe you haven't seen, which I actually like a lot. So a couple of years ago, Jay Malosh went to a solar furnace in uh, White Sands, New Mexico. So if you don't know what a solar furnace is, if you're ever, you know, if you were a kid and you had a magnifying glass and you used to like burn, burn your name in paper and the rest, that's basically what this is in a very large size, right? It takes all the sun's light, reflects it down to a little spot, and it goes bang, bang in there. And then he actually could shine a lot of light on this rock in a really small spot. You can get up to temperatures of several thousand degrees Celsius. Okay? So this is what happens to a piece of serpentine, which, is an, which essentially is a hydrated olivine. It's somewhat similar to the properties of carbonaceous chondrates. And what you're seeing is this material just starts flaking off. And what we think is happening is here is the, 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 essentially the hydrated silicates in the serpentine are, are essentially vaporizing, and they're shooting off, and they're taking a lot of the rock with it. And so this whole thing is falling apart. If this were to happen on a real asteroid in space, it would probably not only lose a lot of material, but you might not create a lag deposit. And so that would actually allow you to keep burning and burning through the asteroid to break it up. So I don't know if this is what's happening, but it's fun to look at. And uh, maybe there's some other processes as well. So, so anyway, that's our, so here's my conclusions. I know I'm already long on time, so I'll stop there and take questions. So thank you. Absolutely. I mean, I mean we, this model suggests low albedo asteroids, which we think are probably have higher amounts of volatiles, break up more readily than high albedo ones. And that suggests volatiles are intrinsic to the process of breaking them up. But precisely what's breaking them up, we don't know. So I'm, I'm, I'm being uncertain on that, but I think you can think of lots of interesting ways how this could be, be, a, be a factor. are layered silicates where you have OH in there and you tear those things out of the layered silicates you're essentially breaking the silicates apart and leaving a lag and 
doing the sorts of things that you're talking about. The, the thing I worry about about leaving a lag, though, is if you leave a lag, then you have such sort of this kind of thermal boundary. I think that may protect the rest of the asteroid. So I think somehow if you're going to, what we're finding is if you're going to have these disruptions happen, they have to happen fairly rapidly according to our model. And so uh, it's got to be something that's pretty dramatic. It can't be a slow, steady, million-of-year process. Well, but you've also got a shorter. lot of solar wind, and if you're breaking this stuff up and, and having to find particle size, then essentially the solar wind is, is whipping your lag out of there. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, could be, it could be combinations of things, too. So. One more question. Sure. Uh, like, you know, we've, we've talked about this before. Just for completeness for, for the audience, because we've talked about it, but yeah. right, uh, the asteroid Phaethon has been observed. Yep. It's a very low uh Low uh, perihelion NEO. It's been observed by Dave Jewett, among others, like Umberto, I think, uh, to uh, have to be acting as though it's a rock comet where it seems to be vaporizing. Um, and also, I'll note that again, for completeness, it needn't necessarily. It's not shown that it needs to be volatile rich. That could just be that the low albedo means the temperatures are higher. So. It could be just a, a silicate vaporation. At least that, that hasn't been shown I, in these I, talks. I, I, I agree with all that. I, I can't say more than what I have there. And on the, when it comes to the mechanism, there's a lot of work, cool work to be done. So. Warm. Okay. Warm work, cool work. Let's thank our speaker.